Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here uh, again with more snow than last year. <laughs> um, so I'll tell you today about our work on uh, neural codes for natural navigation in the hippocampal formation of bats. So you know, I'm broadly interested in, uh, in neural basis of behavior, which is of course uh, a very broad topic. So what we, we focus on mostly is neural basis of spatial behavior, spatial memory, navigation, things, things uh, related to space. Uh, and also, uh, as Thiago said recently, uh, more social questions. So the, the brain areas that will be the, the heroes of today's story are the, the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex is in the rat, which we know uh, are important <coughs> for memory in general and spatial memory uh, in particular. And as you all know, but I'll still say it, in these brain areas, uh, people over the years found interesting <coughs> cells with spatial uh, properties. So uh, O'Keefe uh, discovered uh, in the hippocampus uh, uh, place cells. So if you let a rat run in a square box, maybe one by one meter in size, the black line is the trace trajectory of the animal. Red dots are spikes of an individual, um, individual uh, a neuron in the hippocampus. You see that this neuron likes to fire in the northeast corner. You can turn it into a heat map like that. So he called these neurons place cells. A different neuron might fire here or there or here. So if you record an ensemble of these neurons, this uh, sort of uh, tells you where the animal is. It's a, it's a cognitive map for self-location. Um, then uh, a little over the, a decade ago, the Moses have discovered grid cells, which are just like place cells in the way you do the experiment. But the firing is, is somewhat different. Instead of firing in one location in the environment, they fire in a set of different locations that form a hexagonal lattice. So by looking at that, you can immediately th uh, think this is uh, a sort of uh, almost a millimetric paper, just hexagonal, not, uh, not uh, square. So maybe you can use this to measure distances, for example. Um, and they also had direction cells, <coughs> neurons that don't care so much about the position of the animal in the environment, but they encode more the, the head direction. So you can think of them as, as sort of a compass. So we have you know, cognitive maps, uh, cognitive rulers, to measure distances and, and uh, neural compasses in the brain. So all the elements that you'd like to have to build a navigation system. Um, and what we ask in the lab is sort of the following question. How does real life navigation differ from navigating in a one by one meter empty box, which is the typical experiment? Or sometimes you'll have uh, uh, rats or mice running on a, on a linear track, but these are really highly simplified experiment in, on the most part. And you can give several answers here. So first of all, the world is not flat, it's complex and three-dimensional, so how, how is, does that affect the, uh, the system? The world is not empty, it contains goals, so how are goals represented? The world is not one meter in size, navigation occurs even kilometers, over, over kilometers, even rats, wild rats in, in the country, in the city, they tend to go sh shorter distances uh, because uh, there's much more food available, but there are studies that track rats outdoors and they can go up to one kilometer per night. So it's, it's, these are much larger scales than have been tested. And also animals often navigate together. So uh, do, is the uh, group uh, dynamics or social interactions affect the system? So you can give more answers here, but these are things that we address experimentally directly in my lab. And this is essentially <laughs> the outline of what I'll be talking about today. So well, we study this in, not in rodents, but in bats. And I'll, I'll leave it to the end to um, why bats? It's, it's important for me to, to stress that you know, we're, we're trying to understand the brain, not to understand the bat. Just bats allow you to ask questions that are difficult or sometimes impossible to study in rodents or humans because of their behaviors, because they move in 3D, because they move very fast, so they can cover much larger spaces, because they have interesting uh, sensory systems. So we try to capitalize on their interesting behaviors to ask um, general questions about uh, systems neuroscience. So these bats are very common in Israel. They're called the Egyptian fruit bat, but in fact, they are common all over from South Africa to uh, Iran and, and Turkey. Uh, and they're very big compared to the most bats that you uh, know from Europe or the US. Uh, these bats are much bigger than 150 to 180 grams, uh, which means we can put a lot of equipment on them, lots of neural telemetry systems and localization tags. So when I moved from the um, US, in the US, I, in my postdoc, I worked on the big brown bat, which is 15 grams. And, you know, um, it helps to increase your animal tenfold. <laughs> also need to miniaturize the equipment, but it's kind of a low-tech solution to the miniaturization problem. Um, they also are actually very visual. So if you look at their eyes without me showing you any data, you'll believe me that they actually see very well. In fact, their visual acuity is much better than that of rats. They also have the sense of sonar. So they have two 
distal sensory systems with which they can uh, uh, um, sample the environment. And so just to put you into the mindset of the navigation in bats, this is from a study we've done uh, several years ago where we've tracked bats with GPS tags that store the information. We put it, we, we, uh, put it on the bat's back um, and we released the bats either at the cave or we also translocated them, I won't show you that. And bats, when released at the cave, so they sleep in caves and they go to feed on particular fruit trees that are fruit bats. And this is an example from one bat that over seven consecutive nights flew from the cave to the tree and back again. Each color here is a different night. And you can see that, the, first of all, this bat and other bats as well, they definitely know where they're going. They're returning to the same individual tree for many nights. And also, uh, so they form a nice flyway. It's not perfect. There is you know, a width of maybe one or two kilometers, and there's also some spread in altitude. It's not perfect, but definitely uh, they're good navigators. Um, so this is all that I'll be talking about. I think this looks like it's dying if there's any other pointer or batteries. Um, so what I'll talk about today is uh, uh, 3D spatial codes in the bat brain. I'll mostly focus on unpublished data on 3D grid cells. This has been already published. I'll talk about vectorial representation of spatial goals in the hippocampus, social place cells, and also now episodic cells, new, new things that we found also unpublished, and also unpublished data on neural basis of kilometer scale navigation. So about half of what we'll be talking about today, or more than half, is unpublished. Thanks. Um, Okay, so 3D spatial codes in the bad brain, these are the students, former and, and current PhD students who, who studied the, these neurons, 3D places, 3D direction cells, and 3D grid cells. So first of all, we started by doing the 2D experiment, by ratifying the bat, you know, letting bats crawl in a two-dimensional box for comparative purposes. So we see, do we find the same things, you know, a, a square box with white cue card, exactly as you do in rodents, same types of tetrodes, same recording me methods, thanks. And, uh, and uh, we found the same kinds of neurons, uh, place cells, grid cells, border cells, which I didn't mention, our neurons sort of encode the borders of the environment, and, uh, and head direction cells. Um, then when we went to, uh, uh, to uh, 3D, uh, we developed methods, I'll, I'll mention a little bit more about this later, but we developed methods for wireless recordings. At that time it was by transmitting the data, and now we store the data on board the animal. Uh, we were able to record 3D place cells, so, uh, in this case, uh, the neurons, as you see in this example, whenever the bat flies to a particular volume in the room, like a, a sphere in the middle of the room, uh, the neuron becomes activated. In fact, more than 90% of the neurons were spherical like that. And that means that the resolution in the uh, x, y, and z dimension is the same. It was uh, debated whether like, the z dimension is special and should be encoded differently. So at least in bats, in flying mammals, uh, the, the, this representation is isotropic, same resolution in all directions. Uh, and Arsene Finkelstein uh, later looked at head direction cells in the presubiculum, dorsal presubiculum, which is the area where head direction cells were initially discovered in rodents, and he found three-dimensional head direction cells, neurons that fire whenever the bat's head is looking in a particular three-dimensional direction, like here, you know, um, uh, various two-dimensional directions. Also, there is an interesting story there about the coordinate system by which these are represented. I can tell you later on for those that are interested, but for, for lack of time, I, I want to go to newer stuff. Um, so, Gilligan Ossau, uh, PhD student in the lab, is now looking at representation of 3D space in the medial neuronal cortex of flying bats. So, so this is how grid cells look in, in rats, two-dimensional grid cell, and it is characterized Typically, we think about the hexagonality, okay, the hexagonal structure, hexagonal lattice. Uh, but you can also think about another property, which is maybe even more basic, and that ha is having a fixed distances between fields, right? These are just different facets of what happens in grid cells. And we asked ourselves, wh what would we find uh, in 3D? So wh what, what should you expect for 3D grid cells? So this is in 2D, these are various possibilities in 3D. So for example, you might expect, as, as was, uh, uh, argued by K. Jeffrey, for example, maybe the, the, the Z is special, so you'll ha have like cylindrical fields that are elongated and they might be stacked, so something like a cylindrical hexagonal lattice. Maybe we'll find a, the analog of, of hexagonality in 3D, which is these hexagonal lattices that are called FCC and HCP lattices. They have these closed packing properties, um, or some other lattices, like cubic lattice. On the other extreme, we might find some, some completely random arrangement of fields, or we might find something that's in between completely random and a lattice. So these are some of the possibilities 
that we considered. And so to address this, uh, what Gilly did is in the flight room that we have in the lab, we have several flight rooms, this is the big one, it's uh, almost five by six, uh, by six meters, uh, we had a series of, uh, uh, of, kind of landing balls uh, in the perimeter of the room at various heights kind of to encourage bats to sample three-dimensional space, and the bats were flying uh, through this room, and we had this uh, wireless electrophysiology system to record the activity of neurons in the medial internal cortex, and the bats filled space uh, rather nicely and flew you know, on average about two kilometers in, in air, some days less, some days even up to six kilometers, but, but they, they sampled space, three-dimensional space, rather densely. So again, the flight speed here is important <laughs> because they are able, within a recording session of an hour or so, to, to sample space really well. Putting the cues in the environment doesn't... We have cues. Say again? Does, uh, putting these cues in the wiring doesn't make a problem if there is a visual response or an uh, we, the, It could be, because actually we find other neurons that I won't be talking about that seem to respond preferentially to these, to these objects. That actually some of them even code specifically these objects. Uh, but the grid cells don't seem to care about them so much. And we have to put something, even if we didn't put anything, they will still land somewhere. They'll develop their own preference and decide this is the three corners that I like and they'll make their own stations. So we just distributed them evenly and at various heights, especially it's important because if we put them in one height above ground, then they'll essentially mostly be flying in, in a plane. So we really have to have these from very low. I mean, they even go lower than, this is cartoon, but in reality they really from, from like this height to almost the ceiling. So they'll kind of to encourage them to fly at various altitudes. Um, so these are eight examples of neurons that uh, Gilly recorded from the medial neuronal cortex. And you see immediately that they have this kind of a, um, a you know, multiple fields. Uh, maybe it's hard to understand by eye exactly what's going on, it's a lattice or not, but they have these multiple fields, certainly not, uh, not uh, uh, vertical, um, um, vertical uh, uh, columns. So um, we detected stable fields, I won't go into details, we took actually a lot of time to develop these, uh, these criteria for identifying a field that's robust and real and, and stable, you know, the individual field is stable, so then, you know, some little blips like that will not get detected, but the more robust stuff will, and so we have ways to detect now the fields, and, and then, so, yeah. I don't know, it's hard to compare directly, because nobody really is doing the per field stability analysis in 2D, so, so I don't know. We just wanted to make sure we take, you know, real fields rather than some, uh, some uh, noise. Um, and, uh, and so we had or recorded 66, from India Lurana, cortex, 66 cells with more than 10 stable fields. Um, and then, uh, so remember I told you about these fixed distances in 2D, so we wanted to see do we have fixed distances also in 3D. So for that we analyzed the distances between nearest neighbors, so for each field, we took the three nearest neighbors and, and, you know, so took these three distances, then went to the next field and took these three distances, so collected all these uh, uh, triplets, not counting twice, of course. And then we can uh, plot a histogram of these interfield distances. So for this neuron, this is how the histogram looks. And you see by eye, it looks pretty narrow. So it looks like nearby fields have rather fixed distances. Um, and so you can quantify this by looking at the coefficient of variation, uh, standard deviation by div divided by the mean of that histogram. So this gives you a number, so this coefficient of variation for this particular neuron is 0.17, which actually is, is quite small. Um, so it's a narrow histogram, and it's, it's, it's smaller than a, th a thousand shuffles. So then we say this neuron is significantly, uh, uh, has a significant fixed uh, interfield distances. Um, so the, some, some of the other neurons uh, did not have, you know, the significant uh, interfield distances, but they still had these multiple fields, and both of these, the, the, the neurons that have this, uh, um, have this significant uh, uh, distance, fixed distances, which w th these were uh, the 3D grid cells, and the multi-field cells, which did not have this fixed distance property, they displayed another property that is known from rodents, which is 
uh, that they, they show spatial gradient along the dorsal ventral axis of, uh, of the entralinal cortex. So as you go uh, kind of dorsal ventrally in the entralinal cortex, in rodents you see an increase in spacing and we found uh, in kind of the, the distances between fields and we found the same <coughs> for both of these populations. Um, and next we asked, is, is there a lattice? Okay, so we found that for a subset of the neurons, 20%, we have these fixed distances, but is it a real lattice? And the answer is actually no. Uh, we fitted, first of all, we fitted, uh, we did an exhaustive fit, kind of the brute force, unelegant um, <laughs> way, which is to simulate three, all possible three million combinations of uh, <laughs> angles uh, of, F, of these lattices and positions and, and wavelength and we found no neurons. So it's an example from one neuron, the real um, fit error, uh, which is the metric of how close it is to an FCC versus the shuffle, you see it's not significant, and same was for all the neurons. In fact, no neurons were significant FCC or HCP. And moreover, we looked at also the distribution of local angles, which I won't go, go into, and it, it doesn't show any peaks, because let's say if it was a cubic lattice, then you'd expect to see a peak at 90 degrees, but there are no significant peaks at any angle. So there is really no, no lattice. So again, I'm kind of skipping a lot of details, but we basically, with, with this set of analysis, we, we could rule out this. I didn't show you that, but we showed that these fields actually are spherical, have the same size in the X, Y, and Z, so we can rule this out. It's not a lattice because of this FCC fitting and HCP fitting, and also because of the angle, so it's neither of those. But it's also not random because we have these fixed distances. So it's, it seems like it's somewhere in between, between a perfect lattice and totally random. Um, so just to understand, some of you might be confused now, how can you have something like local distances but not a global lattice? So this is a um, um, kind of <laughs> an illustration of that. So here is a, a perfect global lattice, yeah, honeycomb. So you see that you have this hexagonal structure here and it's a copy there, right? So it's the, the angle here and here is the same. So it's really translationally invariant. So this is, uh, you have fixed distances locally but also uh, a lattice globally. But here's an example where you, it's clearly there's structure here when you look at it, there's local distances, but you see that the angle of this thing and this thing changes. So this is, you have a local structure, but it keeps kind of changing over space, in this ca case over the, the fish, in our case over the room, okay? So you can have uh, a local distances preserved, but no global lattice. And to model this, we paired with uh, some theoreticians, Chaim Sumpolinsky, Ram Burak, and Yonatan al Khadef. Uh, well, they actually did all the modeling work. <laughs> And, and they come up, came up with the following idea. It's a very simple model that, as I'll show you, can explain both what happens in 3D and in 2D in one simple model. So the idea is that you have just pairwise interactions. The only thing that happens here is pairwise interactions between pairs of fields. And they assumed this form uh, of, a, of interaction potential, but it, it can work also with, with other forms. But this actually is something that physicists love. It come, comes up in a lot of uh, physics systems and it's called the Leonard Jones potential, and essentially it has, this is the distance between the pair of fields, and it has a repulsion at short distances, so when the two fields are really close, they want to be repelled from each other, so this is this part, so they want to be repelled each, each other. At a long distances, they want to be attracted to each other, and there is a minimum, which, and there's a parameter, this RM essentially sets this, the value of the minimum, but there's a natural minimum where without noise, these fields will want to be, or these particles in physics will want to be at the minimum, okay? Um, now, there's of course noise in the system, so they model it with temperature. Again, I won't go into the details. That introduced fluctuations in field positions. So instead of being at the perfect distance here at the minimum, they can be a little bit to the right or a little bit to the left. So only pairwise interactions. There's nothing that says you should be hexagonal here. But with this simple model, in fact, what they uh, were able to show is that this model fits uh, our data much better than random Poisson. It's we talked about effect size and significance, so these tiny blips that you barely see, these are air bars, so it, I mean, this is like 100 uh, stars here, highly significant, but also a big effect size, so really much better fit uh, uh, for the uh, uh, pairwise interactions for this model than for random Poisson. So this again supports that it's not, it's not a random arrangement of fields. Um, Next, we wanted to look, compare 2D, again, in the model, compare 2D versus 3D, so that one of the things that you should expect for, in 2D, for example, uh, for these perfect uh, uh, hexagons is that in addition to having 
uh, if you now compute all possible distances between, between fields, not just to nearest neighbors, but all pairwise distances, what's called a radial distance function, RDF, then you, of course, have these nearby uh, neighbors, so that will create a first peak in the distribution, like here, but also you have this second, um, uh, you know, second layer of neighbors, so that will create a second peak. And indeed, when, when using the same model, essentially taking a three-dimensional room and assuming that it hi it, its height now is 10 centimeters, so kind of, you apply the same model, just squish the height to 10 centimeters. So turn it into a two-dimensional problem, they get a second peak here, which means that you have a, a lattice structure, but it never happens in 3D. And again, in the two-dimensional case, many of the neurons in these simulations uh, were really hexagonal with high Grignard scores, okay, with something that will you know, make any grid cell physiologist happy. And this never happens in 3D. So uh, the conclusion is that there is really a fundamental pr difference between 2D and 3D. In 2D, you, it's easy to get these lattices, and in 3D, it never, it never happens. So to summarize this part of the story, we found in the middle toronto cortex cells with multiple 3D fields, 20% of them were grid cells that have local distance scale but no global lattice. We found the same anatomical gradient as in rodent grid cells. And we suggest that the fundamental property of grid cells is not the hexagonality per se, but having multiple fields with a characteristic pairwise interaction distance. And in 2D, the model just, you get hexagonal lattice as an emergent property. It's an emergent property of having pairwise interactions confined to 2D. But when you don't confine them to 2D, when you go to 3D, then the same exact same model, exact same fun uh, functional form, just you, you, you increase the, the height of the room, the same model yields only local structure but no global lattice exactly as in our data. So the same simple model of pairwise interaction explains both what's going on in 2D and in 3D. Yes? Have you tried to record grid cells from buds confined to 2D space? Yes, we did, but it's really difficult. So we've done that the previous and we published that. What we found it really difficult, basically we failed <laughs> recording both because it's really difficult. We want them to, just physically for the animal, we want them to fly a lot and cover 3D space really well, which is you know, tiresome, and then also cover 2D space really well, which is also tiresome, and having both for the same neuron, it just it didn't work. So it's either like this was very too sparse or that was too sparse. So basically, unfortunately, it's, it's really difficult for the same neuron. But on different days, we can of course do it. Because my question is, do you expect this difference to be like inherent to the organism or a function of the environment? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I would love to do that because, for example, of course, you can if having a bat fly in 3D and then land and crawl right in the same environment, you can have 2D surfaces and 3D space. It just doesn't, uh, doesn't work. Uh, but this will be a, a great question. How does the 2D structure you know, extend to 3D? How does it kind of break down into this uh, thing? Yeah. Does it has to move actively in the environment, or you can just passively move in? Well, we haven't done the passive translocation. Um, so it, it moved here. In, in place cells, many years ago, uh, McNaughton has shown that if you passively move a rat such that it can't really move its legs, uh, then the place activity falls down. This was actually, it's a paper from around 1990, and this was the beginning of these theories of, of path integration, which I have a different interpretation for that, but this was really the starting point for people to say, okay, if the animal has to locomote for this to emerge, then it must uh, be related to locomotion. I personally, I'm not so sure about this, because then other, another thing that happens in rodents that are kind of confined like this, that is that they do less have active sensing of the whisking, etc. So it could, you're also affecting the the sensory side as well. So I don't think it has been cleanly shown. Yes? In medicine rats, there's this idea that that anatomical gradient isn't smooth. But right. Like discrete modules. Right. But it, it wasn't clear. No, we, it's hard for us to see because from every individual, for that you really need to record a lot of neurons from an individual animal and we don't have as many. We are sort of like it used to be <laughs> Uh, Ten years ago, so it's hard for us to say. I mean, yeah, you do squint like that. You can imagine, you know, every four neurons, you can imagine uh, jumps, but we can't really so see. It looks smooth, maybe because it's many. You no, know, this is pulled. What I showed you is pulled across animals, right? It's pulled across animals, so I can't really say. Uh, it's a kind of question. So, how do, what does it affect? How does it affect our thinking about grid cells? So, I think it has. Several effects. So first of all, there are models of how you, you can use grid cells to encode um, position, what's called the modular codes, right? Because you have these grids in, in 2D, grids in one scale, then grids in another scale, then grids in a third scale, then like in a stereotax, like in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the stereotax when you have two different scales, you can actually get 
you know, better precision over longer distances. Uh, so the, these are the kinds of module codes that people develop, but these rely uh, inherently on having a perfectly periodic firing. So this means that at least this model needs to be you know, either abolished or modified. And what's maybe more reasonable is that these grid cells can encode distance rather than position, because it's still unclear whether grid cells encode absolute position or distance, which is relative position. And, and maybe with this it's easier to encode distance and position. But, or you can develop you know, different decoding scheme to encode positions. It only affects, so you have to do, come up with, with how to decode this thing. Uh, and the other is, yeah, about the question about the metrics. So there is mounting evidence, also in 2D, when you start distorting the environment or in larger environments, the grids in 2D also starts to get distorted. And then what does it mean? It can mean two things. Either the grid sets are not a metric or, which I find an interesting question to look at, is maybe they are the metric, but maybe the environment is actually perceived differently, right? In 2D, for example, if you, if you have distortions of the grid in different locations, it will be interesting to look at the perception of space in different locations and environments, which is a very difficult question to ask, but I think that John O'Keefe, one of the reasons he's developed this honeycomb maze, for those of you who know, is exactly to ask these kinds of questions, because there we can assess the, the, the metric <laughs> at all possible locations. Okay, uh, let me move on uh, to something that is not so much, uh, is, I would say it's a bit of a side story, because this, this uh, course is about behavior mostly, and this is not so much behavioral, uh, more, more heavily in the neural side, but because I know that you discussed the comparative question, so I think this is a really good example of why comparative studies across species matter. So this is about non oscillatory phase coding and synchronization in the bat hippocampal formation. Um, so already several years ago, we published several papers that showed that there is an interesting fundamental difference between the hippocampus and neural cortex in in bats versus rodents, and that is the lack of the theta oscillation. So if you stick an electrode in the hippocampus or into the cortex of a rat, and you compute, in this case, the power spectrum of the LFP, you have a huge peak at 8 hertz. You do the same for, which is the theta oscillation, you do the same for, um, for bats as nothing. And likewise, it's, it's quite similar in, in primates as well. You don't get this very prominent theta. It's, it's a very much a rodent thing. And um, so we, we published already several times. And we got uh, kind of several uh, critiques on that. One was that maybe um, we don't have, uh, we, know, we should look at interneurons that have extremely high firing rate and there, if even a small oscillation will be easier to detect just because of the power, higher firing rate. And also interneurons are extremely oscillatory in, um, in, uh, in the hippocampus. They're called, theta, uh, kind of historically they were called theta cells because they are so oscillatory. So maybe there we'll find something. So we've done it and we looked at interneurons this is an example of what you see in a rat. This is a, uh, we took from the from Buzaki's lab. So clearly, very oscillatory. This autocorrelation of the spike train of an individual neuron in C1 of a rat, highly oscillatory, clear theta oscillation. We do the same for these four example neurons. There's really nothing, and um, and we also looked at other cell types, place cells, uh, grid cells in 2D in flight. And the summary of this is, uh, I think, pretty clear. Uh, in rats, we, we, now, we took data from the Moser lab and from Buzaki, so rat, and we analyzed, the, ran the exact same analysis, same binning, same computations, so exactly everything the same for the rat data, and then we find that 67% of the rat neurons by our criteria are significantly oscillatory, whereas in the bat, zero neurons, zero out of 166 were significantly oscillatory, neither interneurons, nor 2D place cells, nor 3D, nor 2D grid cells, so really, nada. Okay, next, so this is kind of reinforcing this negative result, but then we asked, but is there something that still remains? Um, and here comes the twist in the story. So in rats, this is how the theta oscillation looks, very periodic. So this is the LFP um, in, in the rat hippocampus, and when we stick the uh, a tetrode into the bat hippocampus, it's, it really looks like nothing, okay? That's clearly different. <laughs> Uh, but then we asked, okay, maybe, so, okay, so this is the, the LFP in the bat, but you can sort of smooth it a bit, and, and you can still identify individual cycles, okay? So here's a long cycle, here's the shortest cycle, so maybe on a cycle-by-cycle -cycle basis, you'll still have things like uh, phase locking. So we know that neurons in the hippocampus phase lock onto these, uh, onto these periodic theta oscillation. Maybe on a cycle-by-cycle -cycle basis, we'll still have it in the hippocampus as well. And indeed, that turned out to be true. So these are uh, six example neurons that you see when you plot the count, the number of spikes 
And this is two periods of the phase, and you see that these neurons are clearly uh, phase locked. And in fact, across the population, 44% of the BAT-C1 principal neurons had significantly non significant phase locking, okay? In the time domain, there was nothing, as I told you. Why? Because the LFP itself keeps changing. So when you do an autocorrelation in the time domain, you see nothing. But when you identify cycle by cycle the periods, you have this phase locking. Okay, so that's nice, but you know, maybe to be expected at the end of the day, LFP reflects population activity, so you'd, you'd expect this, these to be correlated. But then we became more bold and asked, can you have also phase coding without an oscillation. So uh, in, the, uh, 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 in the hippocampus of rodents, there's this phenomenon called phase precession, that as the rat or mouse runs through the place field, the phase or the relative timing of the spikes relative to this ongoing LFP, the ongoing theta, gets earlier and earlier. So if you look at the phase, it, 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 it encodes position of the animal, in addition to this classic rate code, which is the place cells. So we, we did the same now with the bats. And here you see an example neuron where we plot the position, uh, and this is the phase, and you see this kind of uh, negative correlation. It's again two cycles, the negative correlation, meaning again that the phase gets earlier and earlier as the animal moves through the place field. So this is phase, phase precession, and we also just binarized it, look at the early positions versus the late position, and then and look at the spike to the LFP in the late position versus early position, and there's a clear difference there. So this just means that the phase of spikes relative to the LFP encodes information about the position of the animal. And again, 30, a large fraction of the neurons, 38%, uh, show this property. Now at this point, you again might be confused. How can this be? How can you have a non to phase code? So let me uh, illustrate you by a model that's not our model, it's something that Mike Meta published some years ago. So there are many models of this phase procession. One of them is this ramping model. The idea is that uh, you have an, an, an oscillatory inhibition that's coming into the hippocampus. We know that comes from the medial septum, an oscillatory inhibitory cycle. And then as the animal goes through the place field, you have this sort of an iceberg, a subthreshold iceberg of excitation. So this is kind of a ramping exci excitation. And then in this model, the idea is that as the animal goes to the place field, you see the neuron will fire in this model whenever the excitation goes above the inhibition, which are the green dots, and you see that the phase of the green dots relative to the oscillation gets earlier and earlier. So this is a simple way, simple model to get phase precession, but then you do the same model for our uh, non-oscillatory signal in the bat, and likewise, the green dots get earlier and earlier relative to this, uh, to this phase. So you can get uh, phase precession without, without an oscillation. So, to summarize this uh, short part, analysis of the in vivo data from bats, first of all, did not reveal any movement-related oscillations to any frequency in, in either of the, uh, of the neurons that we looked at. Now, this has important implications because in rodents, there are three phenomena that are coupled together. You have oscillation, the state oscillation, you have the synchronization, that this oscillation synchronizes neurons together, and you have the coding of position. And these three are always thought as a package, okay? It's kind of, they have to come together. But what I just showed you, that in bats, you do have these two, but you do not have that one. So this actually means that what's important for the function of the hippocampus is presumably this thing. And we predict that maybe you'll find, likewise, synchronization, coding of position in a human hippocampus and monkey hippocampus where you don't find theta either. And now people are, uh, have now started uh, to look at that. So I really think this is, a, a, at least to, to me, it's a nice example of the comparative approach. If you ever only studied rats and mice, you'll think that you have this package and that oscillations are important. And what we say, no, oscillations per se are not important. What's important is synchronization for transmitting information between uh, brain areas and the coding of position. And these do generalize across species. Okay, so it's kind of a direct example of the comparative approach. Okay, um, let me switch gears to telling you about vectoral representation of navigational goals in the bat hippocampus. So as I mentioned already early on, um, this is some, was something that was uh, unknown. So, um, so to navigate means effectively to get from point A to point B. This is kind of the end result. And all the neurons that I told you so far have something to do with point A, right? Play cells tell you you are here in point A. Grid cells tell you something about local distances at point A. Head direction cells tell you something about, you know, north or relative north. But, you know, where is, you know, where is uh, B? Where is my goal? Okay, I know that the, um, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, the room where we had breakfast is, you know, about that direction. I don't see it, but I know it's there, and so do you, right? So we have you know, some, some arrow in our brains that can tell us where is this thing, 
but where is this in this navigational system? It just does not exist. So Ayelet Sarel, a PhD student in the lab, has asked this question. And so to, just to show you that that's nowhere, their goals are outdoors. This is from a, and some newer data that we collected together with Yossi Ovel, my former postdoc, who is now has his own lab at Tel Aviv University. This is a bat that we recorded. This is our champion bat. We recorded from it data over 75 nights in a row. I'm showing just a small subset of these nights. It becomes pretty complicated. But here you see that it flew, this particular bat flew to this tree for many nights. Then it switched to that tree, and then on night number 33 in Cyan, it started flying to the direction of that tree, but then changed its mind and went pretty straight to this tree. And some other nights, it will do things like shortcuts, sh like that, or go to another tree here. So really fantastic uh, things to look at, uh, which I won't do now, but just this is really to show you, to, to make the point that they know where, where multiple goals are. They know where the goals are, and it's definitely important for them. Uh, they have to feed every night. Um, so, so how, is that, the, how does that work in the brain? So um, to address this, we, we did the same kind of experiment as we've done before with the place cells, but with one twist, and that was we introduced a goal in the middle of the, of the room. Uh, again, one of these landing balls at about this height, and the bat uh, was kind of flying, landing on this thing, then flying again, landing again. And um, so here, for example, trajectories. So we did these complex trajectories uh, in the room. And then uh, what, we, what we asked is, is the direction to the goal encoded in the hippocampus? So we, uh, we, we looked at this angle that we call the goal direction angle, which is the angle between the, uh, the goal and you know, where, where I'm heading. Okay, so if, if the laptop is, is my goal and I'm flying in this direction, so this the angle is now 90 degrees, and if I'm flying towards my goal, then the angle is, is close to zero. Okay, so this is the variable we looked at in kind of goal-centric or egocentric uh, coordinates, essentially. And surprisingly enough, I did find a lot of neurons that encoded this variable. So here are a few examples. These two neurons encode the, uh, you know, our, again, this firing rate versus this angle, the goal direction angle, and you see it's clear, clearly tuned to goal direction angle zero in this case. Um, this is a neuron that's also tuned to goal direction, but not zero, but actually 180, so it's kind of where I came from rather than when I'm going. So in these cells, it's independent distance. It, it is dependent. I'll show you a distance in a second. Um, and if we look at the preferred direction across the population of the significant goal direction neurons, we see that kind of two things. First of all, there are all possible angles, but also there's a clear overrepresentation of goal direction zero. So the more neurons are like that, that care about you know, the, going directly to the goal, but then there are all possible angles otherwise. Okay, so this is this peak, and this is kind of here. Um, so how, how is this related to the classic play cells in the hippocampus? Uh, so there's all possible relations. Some neurons, like this one, have goal direction tuning, but no clear spatial tuning. Some, on the other extreme, are classical pure play cells, like this one, that this kind of top view on the room has clear place tuning, but no goal direction tuning. And there are also neurons that are mixed that can encode both position and, uh, and uh, the goal direction. And these are the place cells, these are the goal direction cells. So out of the goal direction cells, about half were also place cells. So it's a mixed selectivity kind of representation. Then we asked, is this really a kind of a navigation or memory-based thing? Because the example I gave you with that, I know where the, the coffee is. This is mental, right? I don't see it. But from what I just showed you, I mean, this could be a high-level visual response. I only told you that in a room where I see the goal, there's a neuron that responds to a certain angle. I mean, this could be just a visual response, right? So we wanted to ask, is this more kind of a mental or memory-based uh, representation? So for this, I added did a very simple twist on the experiment, which introduced this curtain. This is, again, top view in the room. This is a curtain that's opaque to vision and to echolocation. And it was introduced in a random location every day. And the bats were released here, so you know they flew, flew some and then flew around the curtain and found that, aha, today the goal is here. And we measured the goal direction tuning while the bat was here. Okay, so in, this, in the first session, the goal is behind the curtain. Then in the second session, we remove it to the center of the room. And these are some example neurons that uh, I had recorded. So you see that these three neurons had clear tuning to the goal behind the curtain in the first session. Okay, so they encode the direction of the goal that they don't see it. They know, the bat knows where the goal is because it flew around and found it, but it, uh, um, 
it encodes kind of it's a mental uh, uh, encoding. And in the second session, when computing, they're tuning to the same physical location in space, but the goal is not there, the neurons shut down almost entirely. And conversely, we found also a bunch of neurons like that, that like the goal in the center area, then shut down in the other conditions. So from here again, you see that there is the representation is mental or memory based, and also it changes when you, when you move the goal. We don't. We don't. Um, we d well, we, uh, the short answer is we don't. Because you need to measure the goal direction tuning, you need to accumulate you know, a certain amount of flight. So you know, it takes, takes time. But it's f we see it as fast as we can measure it, but we cannot measure it very fast. This is the problem. Um, the next we asked, is there also encoding of distance? OK, uh, another very useful variable. Uh, potentially. So here are examples of six neurons. These are rasters of individual flights. This is the path distance to the goal. And you see that these three neurons, these two neurons really like to fire close. This zero is landing on the goal and it's kind of looking backwards uh, in, in, at distance in meters. And you see that these neurons had, uh, their spikes were occurring close to the goal. Um, these neurons uh, fired, you know, maybe two or three meters away from the goal. And these neurons were kind of crazy. They fired like every time or many times you know, seven meters before the bat landed on the goal, the neuron fired, okay? Um, and we turned these, uh, these uh, distance tuning curves into a color-coded scheme and sorted them by preferred distance. So you see here, we have a lot of neurons that fire at short distances up to two or three meters, but then still sizable proportions of cells that fire at, at much longer distances, from three all the way up to almost 12 meters. So we have all possible distances. And again, here it's a mixed selectivity when we look at, at significant uh, you know, distance to neurons, goal direction neurons, and place neurons, there is, uh, it's a mixed selectivity representation. In particular, when you look at this group that are tuned both to distance and to goal direction, then you can, for those neurons, plot kind of uh, two axes together. So this is an example of such a neuron where we plot the firing rate versus goal direction and the distance. And you see that it's tuned to goal direction zero at zero distance. But also when you go backwards in, in distance, it's still tuned to goal direction zero, but the firing rate goes down. So essentially, this neuron encodes both direction and uh, distance simultaneously. And some of these neurons encoded better the path distance, so the distance along the flown path. Some encoded better the Euclidean distance. So neurons that encode both the Euclidean distance and the direction to the goal, it has a name, it's called uh, vector. <laughs> so these neurons really encode the, the vector uh, to the goal. So kind of to summarize this part, we found neurons that encode the goal direction. It's a memory-based representation. Some of them encode also goal distance. And, and this forms together a vectorial representation. And the reason I'm so excited about this finding because, because of two reasons. One is that this can directly support goal direct navigation because you have here this signal that tells you kind of where to fly. You decode this, this tells you like the instruction where to go. So this is as simple as it gets. Also, there are decades and decades of studies from insects all the way to humans showing that when, and when animals navigate, they have this home vector. They have a representation uh, of, uh, of a home or of uh, an important location in the environment. This is all behavioral studies. And here we found neurons that could potentially be the basis for this representation. And following uh, uh, our results, uh, several uh, labs in rodents started looking for them, and they did it in adjacent brain areas or in different tasks. So, uh, but in general, these three labs already uh, found the representations that are similar to that. So egocentric or goal-centric representations, yes. So how accurate are those vectors in general? And are there errors? And are there error correction mechanisms? So, I mean, the tuning is relatively broad. It's like in head direction cells. I mean, it's not ultra narrow. But of course, the idea is there will be a population coding. And one of the things we want to do now is we've, de we've developed uh, now, like last week we started our, the our first recordings with a 60 tetrod micro drive, really small one, and a 64 channel neural logger. So we can now start recording populations of neurons. And ideally, I'd like to uh, you know, record group, you know, large groups of neurons, even 50 or 60 neurons. It's, it's one dimensional variables. It's much easier to decode. So then we can ask questions at the population level. And one of the things we want to do we are about to construct this year a really complex, complex maze. We'll have multiple goals, because all of this was just one goal at a time. Of course, the question is, each one of us, you can imagine your own, your own you know, hometown. You can, you can imagine yourself standing in a certain location, and go, here's my favorite pizzeria, here's my coffee place, the university, home, whatever. So each of us can represent multiple goals. How does that work? 
it's unknown. So we want to look at that and also do things like, you know, block the way so the bat will suddenly go in the maze and suddenly it has to reorient. So, I mean, I'm fascinated by the question, what does it mean to get lost? So, like, is this vector starting to rotate? What exactly goes on there under these situations? So this is all for the future. We, uh, the short answer is that, that I don't know. Yes? What about reward magnitude or preference? Is that also? So we haven't done it directly. We, this was a thing that we, we thought about, because when you look at that, of course, you can say maybe it's more kind of related to reward. Um, so, the, so first of all, the reason we haven't, uh, uh, so first of all, you know, maybe these neurons are really fine close to the reward zone, are sort of reward related, but certainly I think that these ones don't seem you know, to be like these ramping reward responses that you see, you know, prefrontal or whatever in, 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 in macaques. The reason we didn't try to manipulate it is that it, for the bat, landing itself and resting is also rewarding, right? So, of course, so that's why we just give a standard amount of food. We do, I didn't know like how many kind of what, what's the titration of grams of banana versus minutes of rest. So I mean, we, we decided just not to try to do this. Um, but possibly reward is also important here. But we didn't, we didn't try to, to look at this explicitly. If you separate for by direction of flight? No, we did this, of course. Yeah, no, no, very important. Yeah, yeah, it's very important. Uh, maybe I should make this distinction because it's the difference between head direction and goal direction is that, let's say again, if the laptop is my goal direction, okay, this is goal direction zero, but also when I'm coming from here, this is also goal direction zero, the head direction is flipped down 80 degrees. So in the, in the paper, again, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing the short version, but in the paper we, we did this analysis where we show that this cannot be explained by head direction, but it's really goal direction for multiple uh, distances. Yes, yes, from the approach from various distances and also we made sure that they really, that's why we wanted to put it, it was important to put it in the center of the room so they'll approach it from multiple direction as opposed to putting it, a food port, the classical thing, you put a food port, which people have done, this, as simple as this experiment sounds, having an open field arena with a goal in the middle, this was never done. I mean, this was also, we had this idea to do this experiment for at least two, three years and have just not done it because I was sure somebody did it and, and fails, like, it's, it's not going to work. This is 40 years people are studying the pecans. It turned out, no, I mean, we had just nobody done it. But what people have done is put like food ports, et cetera, reward zones on the borders, you know, the walls of, of, of the box. But then you have these biases, you only approach with certain angles, and then it's really hard to decouple these things. So having a goal in the middle of the arena, which the animals approach from all possible directions, was really crucial for being able to do the analysis. <laughs> Uh, some of them do. So those which encode, you know, the direction from where you came from, uh, immediately after you they take off, start firing. But yeah. Do you have a way of uh, manipulating the cells or determining that these cells are actually <coughs> making the calculation of the vector? Or are they listening to somebody else and saying we're on track, we're on track? Yeah. No, I, I don't. It's hard for me to know. Is it, you know, it, is it? Computed in the hippocampus or is it inherited from somewhere else? It's, it's hard to tell. The, the firing rate of the cells are the same when they are using the memory or when they are seen directly? Um, this I don't know. We haven't looked at that. I, don't, I can't tell you off, offhand. Yeah. So those guys, when they go up to the, that tree, yeah. are they by themselves or is it group? So, <coughs> so some, so let me just say, so first of all, in terms of this neuron, the reason we, we in, to start with, wanted to look at this directional representation is because we thought this would be very robust thing for, also for the outdoors, because 360 degrees is 360 degrees regardless of scale. So this was kind of part of our motivation is that if we find something like this, this will potentially be very general also for, the, for real life. This is of course done in, in the lab. Uh, they, we, we don't really know. Uh, Yossi Ovel, my former postdoc, he's tracking multiple bats together. Uh, juveniles do seem to fly with other bats. Uh, adults, they do go out in the, of the cave together, but they, they don't seem, they seem to navigate individually for the most part. Uh, but it's still a very small amounts of data, so it's hard to tell for sure yet. But juveniles, when they learn the layout of the land, they live many years, something I forgot to say about bats. Bats live 20, 30 or more years, okay? And we study here adults that are like the big males so they can carry the equipment. So we have certainly a bias for ones that have, and we, these are all wild caught animals. So they have 
you know, they've navigated outdoors and have, uh, have learned the layout of the land. And, and this is in the early stages when they're juvenile, it's certainly there's a tendency to fly with others. In adults, when they're already adults, it's, it's less clear. Mm -hmm. Did you say yeah. males? These are males, yeah. We are now uh, starting in the project I'll mention some slides <laughs> uh, later, uh, we're starting to look, uh, planning to uh, look at females as well. But so far we only look at males. Um, primarily because in rodents, people only look at males, so we kind of did the same also, uh, look at the, you know, there are all these biases. You know, we look at the right hippocampus, why right hippocampus, because that's primarily what people do in rodents. There are all these things that, I mean, there are good reasons, why, I mean, that can explain why people think that right hippocampus is more interesting than the left, but generally we, because we have the comparative approach, a lot of the things we do, even though I'm not sure it's such a great idea, but we do, you know, as in rodents, so we can compare. Yeah. Why would the right hippocampus be better? <coughs> why would the right hippocampus be better to record from? Uh, well, I didn't say that. No, okay, so you just copy what you do. Yeah, oh. yeah, I'm saying why males, why right, why right uh, hemisphere, there are all these choices that okay. we did primarily for the comparative reason. Do, you you cycle? Cycle? do the female cycle? Yes. They but they have a very long cycle. It's more like an annual thing. They do twice a, twice a year. Um, Okay, so uh, uh, okay, so I did that. Okay, let me switch gears to uh, the issue of this, the social side. Um, so this is a work by postdoc uh, David Omer in the lab. So here we asked a very simple question. So bats are highly social mammals, and in the hippocampus, this brain area where you, where you have neurons that encode where I am in space, maybe there are also neurons that encode where you are in space, okay? So kind of social signals. So to address this, we did a very simple experiment. We had two bats flying in, uh, in one of the smaller flight rooms. Um, we had a demonstrator bat and, a, and an observer bat. So the demonstrator in blue here was trained to go pretty randomly either to ball A or to ball B. So let's say in this case it flies to ball A and then back to the start ball. And then the task of the observer is to, to mimic it, to do the same. So in this case it also has to fly to A. Okay? If the, if the demonstrator fly to B, then the observer also has to fly to B. So it's a mimicry task. And, uh, and actually while, you know, before, after the, the demonstrator came back, before the observer take, took off, th there was a, a ra th we didn't impose any delay, but they kind of uh, did not fly immediately. They waited for a while, and on average, they waited actually quite a long time, 12.7 seconds, which means it's a memory dependent. It's memory dependent. They have to remember on average for, for quite some seconds you know, where the other was before, so they can mimic it. Uh, this, this puts it already in the kind of hippocampal, at least in rodents, this will be hippocampal um, uh, dependent delay. So, um, so this, has, this task has two features. First of all, attention. We wanted to make sure that the observer attends to the demonstrator, so that then hopefully we'll see some representation of the other, because if it doesn't attend, it doesn't care about the other bat, then we might not find anything. And also we have this behavioral space lamp. You noted that one bat is flying and then the other bat is flying, okay? So then, because of course this is the hippocampus, uh, you have play cells, you have all this other stuff, so if, if they're both flying together, it'll be much more difficult to decode um, what's going on, so we tried to have a situation where when the other bat is flying, this bat is stationary, so kind of a space clamp, so we can better dissociate uh, and make sure, be sure that the activity that we see is related really to the other and not to myself. And to make even more sure, we have done the neurologue or this accelerometer, nine-axis motion sensor that allows us to make sure that really the data cannot be explained by self-head movements at all. I'll show you that. So, so this is an example of, a, of we did find these neurons that we call social places, neurons you know, to respond to the other. So here's an example. These are flights of the self and these are flights of the other. So uh, when, the, uh, when, the, uh, when I'm stationary and the other bat is flying, so these are in gray here, the trajectory of the other bat, you see that this neuron does fire uh, predominantly on the, right, on the right arm, so encoding the position of the other bat. And in this case, they did not fire a single spike for itself when it was flying. So on the left is the self flights, in gray is the self flights, and not a single spike. And this is not a stability issue because this is really interleaved, right? I'm flying, then you're flying, I'm flying, and you're flying. So it's not a stability issue. It's really does not encode my own positions, not a play cell, 
but it does encode the position of the other. Of course, we have the opposite classic place cells, like this one that encodes my position but does not encode at all the other. And there are mixed uh, neurons that are doing both. In this case, it's firing on a different arm for self and for other. In some other cases, it fired on the same arm. Uh, there was a slight tendency to, for the uh, place field for self and other to overlap, but it was very slight. In general, it could be all possible combinations. A uh, very weak relation between them when the place field for self and other. So again, there's a mixed selectivity. Out of these social place cells, about half are also classical place cells. And 18% of the neurons in, the, in CA1 uh, were significant social place cells. And this could not, this activity, as I said, could not be explained by head movements, or by acceleration. We have this accelerometer signal, so when I'm flying, of course, there's large acceleration signal, but when you're flying, it's really flat. And even if we look at those occasional flights when the, the bat, the observer, did move its head, and so the, here example of three neurons when computing the, the social place field, so the, you know, uh, the, the sp spiking in my neurons uh, in, uh, with your trajectories, for all flights versus flight, you know, when we remove those occasional flights when the, uh, the uh, observer did move its head, then the, you see that these three maps are very similar and the correlation between the maps over the population uh, was very high. So really, head movements cannot explain this, uh, self-head movements cannot explain this uh, firing. In addition, we rule out trajectory planning because you might say, really, maybe it does not ex uh, represent the other's position, it represents my own plan for what to do next, right? Because it is a mimicry task, so to rule this out, we did three different controls. I'm just showing you one, where we looked at correct versus incorrect trials. So you'd expect that an incorrect trials will be different, right? Because the, the other bat is doing one thing, but then I'm planning it and doing another thing. But in fact, we saw a similarity between correct and incorrect trials, which argues, and this is across the population, again, the correlations of these maps. So this argues against trajectory planning, and we had additional controls for that. And finally, we asked, is this really a, um, a social representation? I mean, all I showed you so far is that there is a representation of something out there that is moving. I mean, maybe any object that will move out there will be represented. So to test this, we did two additional sessions. In addition to this mimicry session with the other bat, we also had two sessions. One with a, an object, literally an American football, that was moved and it was the same task, a mimicry task. The, the, the football was moved either to a ball A or to ball B, and the bat was, was supposed to, uh, to mimic it and got reward for that. So it's the same task, just with a plastic football instead of a live bat. And then the third session was another object, a cube, was moved, but the bat was supposed to do nothing. The reason it did nothing is because it was not rewarded yet. So they just did not fly, did not do anything. And what we found is that this is an example of one neuron. So you see that it has uh, kind of a, a social place field for the demonstrator, for the other bat on this side, but actually for the two objects, this informative object, the football and the non-informative object, the, the cube, it has a place field on the other side. And these place fields are actually similar. So this looks like the two objects are represented similarly and differently from the demonstrator. And here are five, more, five example neurons. And in each case, this is the demonstrator, and these are the two objects. So you see that the firing for the two objects looks similar and different from the firing for the demonstrator. And this is quantified here when you look at the, we look at the correlations between the map for the two objects, this right bar, it's, it's, it's high and much higher than the correlation between the, uh, the demonstrator on that object or a demonstrator on the second object by these two bars. Okay, so this is definitely a different representation. There is a representation of moving objects. Some neurons do represent these moving objects, but it's different than the representation of the, um, uh, of the live bat. Um, so to conclude uh, this uh, part, our results demonstrate the position of other individuals that explicitly represented the mammalian brain, and the representation of the Pacific is different from the representation of moving objects. I'll just finish the slide and then. And I'll just say that in parallel, we published this back to back in, uh, with, uh, with Isawa's lab from Japan. They found the same, independently, they found the same thing in rats. So slightly different task and different way they did the experiment. But basically, the take home message was the same, that they found neurons that represent the position of the other rat. And we think that social place cells uh, may be important for you know, so social spatial cognition in mammals representing positions of conspecific, which is no, we know is very important for them, but also maybe other things like predators and prey, so it might be very important to know where are other uh, individuals in the room. And we are now starting to look 
at having two or actually some more than two animals moving together because one obvious caveat here is that we add this spaced lamp. So it was important for the controlled situation, but in reality, animals move together. So then how do you decode the signal of self versus other? I mean, obviously, the motor system knows <laughs> if I'm moving or not, right? So there is information in the brain to, uh, to tell these apart, but, but how does that work in these neurons? It's, it's still unknown, so we are, we're starting to look at, we have two different projects where we look at actually two or more animals moving together, trying to look simultaneously at the representation of self and other, and we see all sorts of interesting stuff I don't have time to go into where transiently, you know, within two, it, it, it seems to be distance dependent. So when, I, when I'm far away from the other bat, then I'm only representing my own allocentric position, but when I come close to it, then uh, uh, close meaning we have we have done doing this experiment in a long tunnel. I'll get to this in a second. We have a 200 meter long tunnel. I'll show you data from there. So when I'm getting close to the other bat, when close is 10 meters, um, then suddenly this egocentric signal kicks in. So the representation of the other, and it turns out that there is a matching. This distance where the representation of the other kicks in is exactly where they start to respond to each other with a sonar. So there's a matching of this sensi sensing distance to this transient very transient, because last for only, you know, two bats flying at 10 meters per second, they can, you know, pass each other in half a second, right? So we're talking about like for half a second or a second, they would represent each other and then it's gone. Uh, and the distance for, over which they represent each other has to do with the, with the uh, sensing distance. Okay, so I've now told you in words, unpublished preliminary data, so I'm not showing you that, but this is kind of where we're going with, with these issues. Yes, so. Yeah, basically the question was really, um, what you just hinted at, like if you just one other animal, right. it's, it's pretty clear about how many animals. Right, are. okay, so how many animals? Of course, so I mean, you can take it ad absurdum, which is actually not that absurd because these bats move in colonies of thousands of animals, so do you represent all thousands of animals? I don't think so, so e either it's like you represent the socially important animals or you represent the ones that are ne closest to you or ones on a trajectory of collision with you. So these are the kinds of things we want to look at. I'm, I'm sure that it's, it's not feasible to represent 5,000 tons, and it's unnecessary also. So, so the, we are, we are uh, starting to look at that exactly. I don't know if in monkeys or other animals that they've done, if you look at it, uh, some of these cells as mirror neurons here. Yes. If in monkeys, right. the same cells that uh, always, for example, yeah. this... Uh, Catching something in the first experiment. Yeah. Like the, the so the mirror. That they do, they also fire the right. Or this is really it's, 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 it seems reminiscent to the mirror neurons. And the very first time we showed a poster with this work, we called it mirror neuron, so mirror play cells, I think, or something like that in, in bats. And they killed us. I did have no idea what I was going into. <laughs> it turns out this is whole mirror, mirror neuron field is riddled with these debates because it, because it all has to do with the similar, real similarity between what I'm doing and what the other is doing. So the classic mirror neurons that you think about when you, like Rizzolati style, is really the monkey is doing a certain movement and then I'm doing the exact same movement. But then, uh, let's say, if I'm doing something, it's not exactly the same, it's similar. So a lot of the mirror neurons actually are doing this kind of thing. They're, it's not exactly the same thing, it's sort of similar. And then it kind of becomes vague in, in, in how similar should it be. In our case, the data, it's in the paper, I, didn't, I don't have the slide here, but it, there is a, we're talking about effect size, okay, highly significant but small effect size <laughs> of preferring uh, the place field for self and other to be in the same location. Okay, highly significant but really small. In general, if you look at the correlation, distribution of correlations between the map for self and other, it's all over the place across neurons, okay? There, there is a tendency, significant tendency for overlap, but in general, it's all over the place. So we decided not because of, of this, so what does it mean mirror? I mean, people think about mirror, it's like I see you and then I use this representation to simulate my own movement, right? Things like that, but the data don't seem to support it. So we are going for the, for the kind of weak, weak type of representation, which is I don't care if the representation for me and for you is different. In fact, you know, if you think about hippocampus and remapping, it's very different when I'm moving or you're moving. So like even for remapping reasons, you, it's, it's not surprising that it looks different. All I care is that there is information there. I can decode your position from my neurons. And if that, these neurons are doing different things when I'm flying or when you're flying, okay, then they do. So I'm, when we decided to drop the kind of mirror argument, but it's really in that field. I talked to a lot of people after this poster it's a, it's, I decided just not my debate, so leave it, leave it to them. Yeah. So, um, with the response to the individual, like I was 
location, depending on the trajectory of how they... So, so here we don't know because the trajectory is highly stereotyped. So yeah, it's really... No, no oh, it, it does, it's, it is directional, okay? I, again, I didn't have time to show, but it is directional. So just like place cells are directional, meaning they fire in a different way, one way or the other, these neurons that I showed are always for a particular direction. So they fire, let's say they could have a place field for the other in one direction, but fire, uh, not fire at all in the other direction. So, so this is... Exactly, but it's binarized. It's this, this way or the other. I don't know if it's like the more complex trajectories. This is something we're starting to look now. Um, Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but again, we have this difference between the representation of the live animal and the objects, and we also, I didn't show you, but we had a lot of vocalizations. We recorded also vocalizations, and they, when, with the other bat, there's a lot of social vocalizations going on, and with the football, they're completely silent. I mean, they're not stupid. They don't talk to football. So, uh, so there's clearly, the context is very different. But, but certainly, because there are some neurons that represent also objects, you could also interpret it as, as a more generic thing of dynamic environments. So, yeah. So with respect to the, the targets in space, like the, the food targets, they're, of course, relatively stationary. Um, but other individuals tend to be moving. So what we found with the fish on, unpublished at the moment is that their vectorial representation isn't as we originally thought of where the individual is now. It's actually a projection to where the individual will be in the future. So, you know, if you imagine an individual moving to meet this individual here, if yeah. it's always just targeting the individual, it would right. sort of go in like this. But in fact, it, it moves like this. And so I wonder whether, of course, in the lab, that would not be possible. But I wonder whether when you're in the field and the bats are flying, whether their vectorial representation for the other bats isn't actually, yeah. or has to somehow it's predictive, yeah. take, take into account the yeah. prediction of where they'll be in the future, which would be something fundamentally different from non-social targets, right? It's something extra they have to do. I mean, it's, it, the algorithm yeah. is very simple, or the, the animals adopt. They just keep the animal in the same position on the retina, right? And depending on the position of the retina, you change the time to intercept. Yeah. So even dragonflies do this, like Anthony Leonardo's work. Right. So it's not something complex to encode, but I wonder whether you could find evidence for that future projection. Yeah. So look at that a little bit. So in fact, in the hippocampal formation, a lot of these neurons have these predictive properties. So it's, it's old work already. People have looked for, shown for place cells and for head direction cells that, in fact, if you don't compute like, let, let, I'm talking about rats now. If you don't compute, you know, my, the, my spikes with my current position, but my spikes with position, you know, 10 milliseconds ahead, 20 ahead, 30 milliseconds ahead, or backwards. So like you, and then you do some metric, let's say spatial information of the neuron versus these various shifts, then it's slightly better. The tuning is slightly better in a predictive manner, like 120 milliseconds or so predictively, and similarly for head direction cells, which makes sense because, you know, when even for yourself when you're moving, it makes more sense to represent slightly ahead of time. For the social, we haven't looked at that, and here I think in this uh, task will be difficult because it's highly stereotyped, so all it will do is shift the place field forward, not very interesting. But, but, but what we want to look at now, as I said, we are, we are starting to do these more complex uh, scenarios with the uh, multiple animals, and there one of the possibilities that these neurons will mostly focus on, on collision course, right? And mostly representing animals which would, I'm going to collide. That's predictive by definition. So, so we are definitely going to look at that. But for that, you need variable trajectories. Otherwise, you can't decouple them. I mean, one, one, one problem that was you know, highlighted earlier is the potential for other bats that you haven't got tagged sort of messing with your analysis. It makes me think of what Tom Seeley did to understand how bees really encode information about flowers is he moved his bees to an island where there were no flowers. Yeah. And then he controlled the right. resource landscape. Is that, I mean, of course, the scale of the bats move over is much, much larger. But do you think it's totally crazy? Can you take bats into an it's area not, it's, where it's, there's no other bats and you can then, then put GPS of all the individuals? You have the full it's not, it's not crazy. There are some technical things to, to overcome, but I think it will be possible in the, in the not so far future. Because that would be pretty cool, because then you could look at the scale. It's not science fiction. It used to be science fiction until a couple of years ago. I don't think it's science fiction anymore. Going back to that. So actually what I thought it would be very interesting to maybe cover one of those permanent trees that they yeah. are coming. So, uh, yeah, so these are things that uh, we couldn't do it back then. I agree with you. The reason the original studies we didn't do it because these are loggers. These are GPS loggers. At that time, we couldn't get online data, so the thing had to fall off, and it was glued, so had, the glue had to fall off, and so we only knew the preferred tree of each bat, which is idiosyncratic, 
post factum. In real life, if we could, we had all sorts of ideas of covering the trees or putting trees on carts and then uh, suddenly driving them along. We had all sorts of these nasty experiments in, in mind, but it all depends on being knowing the real time information, which is also now technologically feasible. Again, seven years ago, it wasn't feasible. Yeah. But I thought that if you can make like a, a new point on the route, yeah. which you, with a very big reward, and then test what happened the other day, the second the coming day. Whether they will go directly to that, although it's in a different angle than they used to go and so yeah. on. I can show you on the, the other method to show before what exactly I mean. But they can test whether they have a mentor representation of a big environment and whether they can go directly to a new location that they saw yesterday. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about this because we are starting <laughs> bigger environments now, so I'll be happy to hear about the ideas. So we haven't done any of that, but I'm happy for good ideas. So let me, let me move on uh, uh, and just tell you about uh, uh, unpublished data from kind of the same data set, something we call episodic self, cells for self and other in the bad hippocampus. This is again by David Omer, this kind of a spin off of, this, of the same experiment where, okay, so episodic memory is a memory of personal experience events, so where and when an event took place. So we know a lot about the where, the place representation. What about the when, the representation of time in the hippocampus? And in fact, we know, first of all, the hippocampus is important for encoding new episodic memories. And we also know that there are neurons that encode time in the hippocampus of rats. These were discovered uh, by Zibuzaki lab a decade ago, but many labs, uh, this is only a partial list, have found these what's called time cells. So if you let a rat, in this case, run on this figure eight maze, and before running on this stem, it has to run on this running wheel for 15 seconds, so kind of space clamped, you see, you get neurons that these are, in, these are uh, individual neurons, you have 30 neurons that would fire, one neuron will fire really early on, another one, you know, two seconds later or four seconds later, etc. So neurons fire at particular times and tile the, the behavioral time. So these were called time cells. And uh, now, one problem is that time cells were never tested in different locations, They're always in one location, okay? So we thought, um, can we look at time cells? Um, but for different locations, because in the task that I just showed you, the bat was flying and landing, and there were several of these landing balls, A, B, and the start ball. So actually, three different locations. And can we find time cells that fire differently in these different locations? If so, this will be really encoding simultaneously time and place, so an episode, if you will. So we kind of revisited the same experiment. So the task is the same, the experiment is the same as I just showed you. And yes, we did find time cells. So this is an example of uh, you know, a ta three time cells. So what you see here are rasters, okay? These are individuals. Uh, uh, so what time zero here is landing on the ball. So now we are not looking at what happens in the air, which is what I showed you before, but actually at the, conversely at the stationary periods when the bats are on the ball, they're doing nothing. And, and you see that this neuron, for example, every time the bat lands on the ball time zero, it fires you know, two or two and a half seconds later almost on every trial. On this neuron fires early and this neuron fires later, four seconds. So this looks like time cells, so they really r rather robustly represent time after landing. And again, I'm, for lack of time, I won't show you the data, but we, we have the accelerometer data. You can say maybe they have these little head movement stereotypes, so this really represents some, some stereotype movement, so no, they don't move at all. They just hang there, do nothing. So it's really an internally generated signal. And uh, and the interesting thing is that, as I said, we have now on this, we can have this, we do have the same neuron on three different locations in the room. And in fact, you see that this example neuron is a nice time cell on ball A, but does not fire at all on ball B or on the start ball. So really, they represent time and place simultaneously. You can decode both time and place from these neurons. And this is not just in this example, but across the population, what I'm plotting here now is the population of neurons, you know, 81 neurons. These are the cells that are tuned on A and sorted by their preferred time on A. So obviously they form this, this sequence, but when you plot the same neurons, how they fire on B, there is maybe a little bit of shading if you squint, but it really seems to fire very differently on, on B, the ball B and on the start ball. And conversely, the, the neurons that are tuned to B, 64 of them, um, uh, they uh, look like that on B, but they don't, they seem very, you know, almost random on the start ball on A. Again, maybe there's a little bit of shading here, but in general it looks very different, and likewise for the, uh, for the start ball. So really, the representation is, is highly different 
on these uh, three locations in the room. So we call them episodic cells. Okay, neurons represent simultaneously time and place. Yeah. yeah what, happens, what happens with these neurons when they fly? Basically, when, because here you take a discrete point. Yeah. So a lot of them, I don't have it here, but a lot of them are also place cells, and a lot of them are also social place cells. We still didn't analyze all these uh, conjunctions, but you know, it's a mixed selectivity <laughs> in general. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a general theme that in the hippocampus you generally find find mixed selectivity. It's, it's almost never like discrete population. It's almost never completely overlapping. It's always kind of like that. Um, then we, we looked at, is there also representation for time for the other? Because we can now look at when the other bat landed and align it to time zero. And the answer is that there are neurons that fire particular times for the other bat. So we call them social episodic cells. Um, so really, this is an ongoing work. I'm just showing you a little, uh, a little uh, bit, uh, bit, bit and piece of that. But it looks like, uh, from, from this, um, is that this is a, a first example. First of all, I have an episodic cell for the cells. So you have neurons that simultane simultaneously encode time and place by internally generated neuronal sequences. And also, in a social way, they represent you know, uh, episodes for a, for a conspecific. And just something I had discussed in breakfast or dinner also, I think, with some of the people where we're ha heading now. I have a, a, a new postdoc in the lab, Sakat Ray. Some of you here know him very well, a really great guy. And here we're going to, we are, st we are, we are doing like the most uncontrolled experiment in the history of the lab, but I think it's going to be very exciting. So what we have done is we have set up um, a colony of about 10 bats let them form their, uh, their social, they live there 24 seven, they form this social network, and there's no task. <laughs> they just live there and, and interact. We have these interaction grids, and we have these, it's like a big brother thing. We have here six cameras tracking them all the time, and these localization tags for tracking position, and we, we found ways to uh, track the identities, positions, and head directions of all 10 bats simultaneously in this three-dimensional room, so it takes a while to develop these methodologies. Then the idea would be, so for the social place cells, is the representation different? Because all I just showed you, there's a position, there was one bat, one other conspecific. Here there are many. Is there a different representations for different individuals, for males versus females? Now we have females here as well, for depending on like uh, 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 the hierarchy, uh, social hierarchy uh, ranking, uh, or, or personal preferences. These bats have very interesting behaviors that I don't think rodents really have, or most rodents at least, is that they, they, they are voluntarily feeding each other. Let's say, if you are hungry, I'll give you some food. So they have this social feeding thing. Uh, it's been started a lot in vampire bats, but also it exists in our bats. So kind of, so, and they have preferences, you know, I'll feed you and not you or vice versa. So is there like also different representation for my friends versus, versus not? So a lot of social questions that you can ask and that we are planning to ask both in the hippocampus and also in prefrontal. So we are going really, uh, really social on this. Um, all right, and the last part of the talk, I'll, 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 I'll uh, talk briefly about the representation of large-scale spaces in the brain. So this is work by Tamir Eliav, uh, PhD student in the lab. So I'll, I'll come back to this, uh, this data because this really illustrates the problem. So, okay, so this is the real flight trajectories of, of one bat outdoors, and it forms this kind of flight corridor that's maybe, in this case, 15 kilometer long, two kilometer wide, and about half a kilometer high. You know, they have variability of flight height from 100 meters to 600 meters. So this is kind of the volume that they fly through. So now if you want to take your laboratory size place fields that are 10 centimeter in size and use them to tile this kind of volume, and you want, you know, a few tens of neurons covering each location, then, you know, you can each take your own personal envelope and make the calculation quickly, and it will come at about 10 to the 15 neurons that you will need. Okay, entire dorsal hippocampus C1 has on the order of 100,000 neurons. Okay, so we are 10 orders of magnitude off. There's no way that what we found, find in small laboratory boxes will translate one-to-one -to, -one to the outdoors. It has to be something else. Okay, so what is this something else? This is what we want to figure out. And they also not do it just outdoors, they also do it uh, underground. There are these complicated cave systems that they live in. Here, just you, you turn a little bit to the right, there is a little uh, kind of cavelet there, and there's a, a bat colony, and they fly hundreds of meters also underground in this kind of natural mazes. This is actually not natural, this is a, an ancient quarry from a thousand years ago. You see all these kind of <laughs> sarcophagus uh, uh, niches, etc. But it's, you know, 
it's a cave, it's, a, it's a natural for them. Um, so, um, so to address these kinds of questions, we had to uh, solve three technical problems. One is we have to be able to record neurons at unlimited distances because the early methodology with the wireless recording that I showed you was with transmitting the data. That works in the lab. That could work up to a few tens of meters. There's no way this could work over a really large scale. So for that, we have to store the data on board. So we developed this 16-channel uh, neural logging system that stores the data on board the animal. It's essentially at unlimited distance. And as I uh, uh, said, we, like last week, we started experiments with a new 64-channel uh, neural logger and a 16-tetrode microdrive, so really can record population of neurons and store it on the bat. So it's now unlimited in distance. And we can use it to record really nice spikes. These are spikes recorded in flight. Uh, these are the four channels of, of one tetrode. And uh, you, know, you can get nice clusters, uh, et cetera. OK, so we have the neural recording. The other thing is that we need to be able to measure the position of the bat very precisely, because if we want to dissociate between representations on a 10 centimeter scale versus something else, we need to be able to measure the position of the bat with a 10 centimeter precision over large scales. And GPS is not good enough, because GPS has about 10 meter precision, standard GPS. Why is that? Uh, because, uh, because you have, uh, you know, you measure distances to satellites in outer space, and you have atmospheric aberration, so you, you get these, these more noisy signals. And so now we can also overcome it with, with all sorts of uh, augmentation systems, and we're working on that, that as well. But f in the meantime, what we've found, we found this French company that has this GPS-like system. Essentially, you put ground-based antennas, and you have a tag on the bat, and then you measure differential time of arrival to these antennas, in, uh, not to satellites. And because it's much closer, you get this accuracy of about 10 centimeter, even a bit better. You, we, we measured it, it's about eight or nine centimeter accuracy. So that's over this, this scale, so that's pretty good. And the third thing that we have to develop is a large behavioral setup, because we want to have a controlled experiment, certainly to start, at least to start with, but very large. So what we did is we built this tunnel, it's 200 meter long, and we're about to build this year a tunnel that's almost a kilometer long, 800 meter long on campus. And we put in landmarks, so it's really, it's, it's overground. It's more like a greenhouse or a glorified tent. Yeah, don't imagine a building or anything. It's made of plastic, so it's transparent to RF, so we can measure all these uh, distances to these antennas outside. And then this is how the bat behaves inside. So we, we have food, kind of, again, the same landing balls that the bat like, uh, with, uh, uh, and the two ends of the, uh, of the tunnel. And so this is now 200 meter distance and the bat is flying back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. This is one session, 100 minutes. And you see they're flying like crazy, okay? They just love flying. <laughs> uh, this is basically what, what, what saves us here because like I was really nervous. Yeah, we're going to do this, all this investment, build a thing and like I was worried. So if the bats don't cooperate, they don't fly, what do you do then? Okay, so I start chasing them, what do you do? But like the first bats, <laughs> you release them, all our worries evaporated. They just love flying. Some of them don't even eat so much of the food at both ends. They just do what they like. It's like marathon flyers. We keep them in nice cages, but at the end of the day, it's still small cages, flight cages. And then we suddenly give them this infinite space. They just fly back and forth and back and forth, uh, do this jogging sort of thing. And so they would fly sometimes 100 laps per session, the good bats, 20 kilometers. Even the, the really best bats will be 25 kilometers in one session, 25 kilometers, 100 or 120 repeats. Um, at a high speeds, and it, the speed is very fixed. You see, this is an example for one day. The speed is extremely fixed, seven or eight meters per second. In this case, sometimes they'll fly 10 or 11 meters per second. Again, very stable. This is 40 kilometers per hour. This is really close to what they do outdoors. So it's really close to the real thing. And again, here, this is an advantage. I was hinting at the various advantages of the bat. Here, just having an animal that m flies so fast is a huge advantage because we can have them fly a hundred times this enormous distance and then have really nice rasters. In a mouse, you know, do this thing two or three times and, and it, that's it, right? It can't, we can't really do this in, in, in rodents. Um, yeah? How, how do you think you're able to capture the Z? So, representation of the, environment? the Z in this case is really, and also the Y are not that variable. The, we've built, so we have tricks. We wanted to in this case, we wanted it to, to turn it into a one-dimensional problem as much as we can. So what we've done, knowing bats, is we've built this, um, I mean, it's two and a half meter wide, but we built it like, you know, um, like a cartoon of a house, you know, like, like this, 
with a v inverted V at the top, and they like always to be kind of high up and at the center. So we sort of build the thing so that they basically fly at the center. The deviation in the Y is very small, and also in the Z is very small. We measure it. We are less accurate in measuring Z because the way this works, to measure Z really precisely, we need to have like a half dome uh, of hundreds of meters. So that's already beyond what we have. But we do have, actually happen to have a really big building nearby. So we have an antenna on top. So we do have a reasonable accuracy in Z. It's not 10 centimeters. It's more like 40, 50 centimeter accuracy in Z. So, but, so they don't span Z that much. But here we try basically to turn it into a one-dimensional problem. But down the road, we rely also to ask questions about the encoding of Z. If they can build on that more than each question, how do they sense the gravity? Uh, how do they know the altitude? Well, gravity doesn't tell you altitude. Uh, the altitude they know uh, by, yeah, they, the, by, by vision, uh, by sonar. Actually, they remember that they do have a sense of sonar which gives them direct, if they're close enough to the ground, not at 600 meters, but at 10 meters, they certainly know their altitude really precisely, much better than you, know, you can do with visual parallax, all these things. So they have direct access to distance at a, at a kind of millimeter or centimeter accuracy at short distances. Okay, but this is not for long distance navigation because sonar can work up to a few tens of meters max. When they're flying high up, it's useless uh, just because of the physics of it. Okay, so here's an example neuron that Tamir recorded in this setup. So here, what, uh, what you see is each, so we've separated the data based on the flight direction, the red direction west and the blue direction east. And you see each line here uh, is one flight. So you see these are rasters. So you see several things here. First of all, you see there's a difference between the firing of this neuron going east versus going west. Okay, these are old news. We know for place sales for many years that they fire differently on the two directions. Think of yourself when you're going from home to work or, or work to home, it feels different. So certainly this is old news. The new news are several fold. One is that we have really some very large fields. So this is dorsal C1, where place fields are supposed to be 10 centimeter. Here you go, you have a place field here that's like 20 or 30 meter in size, okay? So it definitely scales up with the environment. Secondly, we have multiple fields, not just one. So we usually think about place to concept, conceptualize place fields as this single Gaussian kind of tuning in one location, and it's definitely not, you have multiple fields. And the most surprising to me is that this is a multi-scale representation, meaning the same neuron can have a large place field here and a really small place field here. Um, and this is another example of a neuron that fires, again, differently in two directions, but it has a, a large place field here and a much smaller place field here. Okay, so and again, we have now hundreds of neurons for multiple animals, it's very robust. It's really always this case of, of large fields, multiple fields, where very few, I mean, sometimes, yes, you do see single fields in one direction, but in general, we have, you know, on average, five or six fields in each direction, and they're multi-scale. And so, um, it looks very different from place sales recorded in small lab setups, and we are now in the process of trying to understand uh, first of all, kind of mechanistically, how can such a multi-scale firing come about? Um, one possibility would be, for example, that maybe in CA3, which projects to CA1, for example, you'll have um, single-scale place fields that kind of converge on neurons in CA1, then together create uh, the multi-scale. So we are starting to record in CA3 to test this. Um, so there's the mechanism side, because there's a lot of models of place fields, place cells, really, a lot of them, none of them, can easily explain this multi-scale property. It's a, think of it as a neuron in V1 that have multiple receptive fields, some of them tiny, some of them big, scattered all over space. I mean, it's really crazy. And also functionally, why? What's the advantage computationally of such a multi-scale uh, uh, multi code? So we are teamed up with Misha Tzodix and we have a student starting soon to look modeling-wise the basic intuition is that, uh, that's kind of Misha's intuition as a physicist, that maybe for, if the environment is very large, then having a single scale representation is not very good. You want a hierarchical, a hierarchical representation where the, the, the large fields tell you you're sort of roughly here, and then the small fields will tell you you're precisely there within these larger fields. So oh, beyond a certain dis, uh, distance, you really need this hierarchical representation. This is, the intuition, he started simulating that, but we really want to understand modeling-wise, why is that, why would that uh, be useful, something like that. But definitely it looks very different in laboratory environments. The decoding of that will need to be very different. So this really, I think, has major implications for how we think about hippocampal coding. 
Okay, so I got to my last slide <laughs> before the acknowledgements. So I have two take-home messages from what I told you today. Um, one is this issue of the comparative approach, which I heard you already discuss, but I think, um, I think it's really important to look at multiple species. I'm not saying we should study you know, all 4,000 or 5,000 mammalian species, but at least some, because from this example that I showed you with the oscillations, um, if you ever studied only rodents, you'd think that it's a package, that you have to have oscillations, but the answer is no. The good news is that a lot of things are very similar. We find the same kind of neurons, a lot of the properties are very similar, but there are some differences, and we have to acknowledge them and find them and find what is invariant across species. So I think having at least some amount of work that is comparative is crucial for us to kind of debug our thinking and understand what's invariant and what isn't. And the second take-home message, which is even more dear to my heart, is this issue of, of natural behaviors versus reductionism. So, you know, for the last 400 years or so, uh, science was very reductionist. You know, I come from, as Tiago mentioned, I come from a physics background, so when you study, uh, you know, a hydrogen atom, you want to study it in a cooled environment, very controlled conditions, and not in some swamp somewhere. Uh, but when it comes to behavior, the hallmark of behavior is that it's highly complex, highly rich, highly context dependent. And I always worry that if we oversimplified our laboratory experiments, we might be missing the very thing that we're trying to understand, which is behavior. So I really, on the other hand, of course, control has its own advantages. So I think we really need diversity. Controlled experiments are good, but we also need to go to more complex, more naturalistic experiments. And as, as you see, I've shown you from our own work, every time we'll, we did a little baby step, in a more naturalistic direction, we found something interesting. We introduced a goal in the middle of the room, just a landing platform in the middle of the room, and, um, and suddenly we found this victorial representation. We introduced another animal in the room, and we found that there is a representation of this other animal, position, time, whatever. We increased the environment, and then all, all hell breaks loose. It looks completely different. So every time we make one step in kind of one dimension, uh, in one direction that's, that's a bit more naturalistic, we find interesting things. And I would like to argue that for every um, um, kind of every uh, domain of neuroscience, it's important also to look at more naturalistic experiments. I'm, I'm writing a book now called Natural Neuroscience from MIT Press, where the, the main premise of the book is exactly that, that it's important to study um, the brain closer to the natural behavior of the animals, because this is the way to reveal uh, uh, some properties that we might have missed completely. So with this, I'd like to end, thank the lab members. I mentioned most of them, we went along, and the alumni, collaborators, and funding sources, and uh, thank you for listening.